Hi, everybody. Hope you're enjoying your hacker summer camp for this year. We are so excited to be here again with you in the IoT DEF CON village. We are going to be talking about the journey of establishing IoT trustworthiness and IoT security foundation. So we're going to be covering some of the key highlights, what has changed in the IoT security policy and regulatory landscape, the technical standard and baseline uh, landscape. Then we're going to tie it up to this broader conversation about the concept of IoT trustworthiness and how it connects to some of the developments with respect to AI trustworthiness, how that concept is fitting in into the conversation. We're going to bring both technical engineering policy perspectives to the table, tying it all together. As I mentioned, my name is Amita. Azari, I'm Director of Global Cybersecurity Policy at Intel's Corporation in our Government Affairs Group. I'm also a lecturer at UC Berkeley School of Information, Master in Cybersecurity and Information Program. I'm joined today uh, by, with two great friends, technical experts, wonderful experts uh, from a network and edge group. Anne Turkanian, she's a security principal engineer in our CTO IoT office, and Ria Chavru, who is a AI ethics lead architect uh, in our group as well. I'm so excited to be here and I would like to kick us off by inviting Anne to tell us a little bit about what has changed in the landscape, why IoT security continues to be top of mind, both with headlines and both in the policy circles. Anne, take it away. Hello, glad to be part of IoT Village again. Here we have experts who are very keen in IoT technology, and it will be no brainer that Internet of Things receives increased attention from industry, policymakers, consumers, and the media. This interest ignited by technology advancement, the advancement that's hitting the production reality, or in other words, the trade-off between the desired outcome of using technologies versus the risk associated with that. IoT came with the promise to change the user experience from focusing on situational awareness to behavior performance or helping to support defined user intent. It becomes smarter and smarter and now with expansion of AI machine learning technologies at IoT, IoT device is in charge of decisions too. We see that Internet of Things evolve. It is no longer about things themselves. It's about overall business. Those things are designed to support. It's about the data processing pipeline. And that explains that increased uh, interest of attackers on IoT devices. Yes, you know very well that there is no lack of IoT security headlights. As you remember, Mirai botnet with the first wave of high visibility DDoS attack that turned IoT devices to a network of bots. Today, it is still valid exploitation. Moreover, the DDoS evolved and the DDoS attack sometimes can be deployed as a distraction from even more nefarious activities. So ransomware and DDoS deployed in combination were DDoS used as a smoke screen with volumetric saturating network bandwidth to clog up the connection for alleged users. In addition, security researchers steadily uncovering severe vulnerabilities in firmware. Among recent examples are IP cameras with UDP technology and uh, G universal replay family of protection and control devices. And finally, the most uh, prominent colonial pipeline attack. Yes, IoT, it was not breached. However, that attack affected uh, uh, OT uh, usage as well. So to ensure the safety of the pipeline, the company proactively disconnected certain systems that monitor and control the physical pipeline function. So that would not be compromised. As a result, uh, we know what happened, right? So definitely these security vulnerabilities attacks are one of the factors that uh, contribute to increased attention to Internet of Things. Now let's look uh, 
a broader picture on why IoT is in the center of the gravity. First and foremost, IoT is about diversity. Diversified markets, plethora of usages, complex supply chain of solution, it's all about IoT. Intersection of IT and OT comes with pros and cons. It brings the best and worst of both worlds. And as we can see on the example of Colonial Pipeline, the uh, attack on the IT resulted in the shutdown of the OT. And finally, uh, most interesting, uh, is, uh, as we mentioned at the beginning, IoT matured and it attracts the cutting edge technologies for the smart functionality. AI and machine learning bring and open up new opportunities. And at the same time, uh, uh, they raise the distinct concerns. A new adversarial attack called Deep Slot, uh, developed by scientists at the University of Maryland, uh, was very interesting. It can force machine learning system to slow down, to crawl, taxing the compute devices, and possibly causing the critical failure in the uh, applications. Uh, so this will result in the loss of efficacy for up to 45% with attackers doesn't even have uh, exact information about the target AI model. Mm -hmm. This brings a new dimension to the problem of IoT risk. As you can see, IoT is morphing, it's maturing, growing, evolving, and there is still a lot of security challenges that needs to be addressed in this space. Now let's switch gears and look at what's happening at policy side. Amit, uh, please walk us through evolving policy landscape. Thank you, Anait. So let's talk a little bit about what has changed in the policy landscape. Obviously, uh, IT security continues to be top of mind for policymakers, but we also have seen how related developments in other landscapes like the supply chain security landscape and across the board conversations in security policy are impacting are kind of trending uh, towards specific uh, new developments on IoT security. So of course, uh, as many of you might be aware, we already have state legislation on connected device security in California and Oregon in effect. We also have a federal law that has passed, the IoT Cybersecurity Improvement Act passed on December. This, the focus there is federal uh, procurement. Uh, so security requirements for federal contractors supplying IoT devices, these are both technical requirements on device and non-technical uh, requirements processes. We're going to walk you through this. This will build on the NISTER 8259 series and implementation is now underway to define uh, these requirements and guidelines. We also have their new guidelines to be developed on the area of coordinate and vulnerability disclosures, including on certain aspects related to federal contractors. Again, all of this in, in development on in implementation. Um, this is, of course, interacting with the development, the major development in the landscape, the executive order issued by the Biden administration, comprehensive, robust offer effort with respect to uh, software secure development practices, supply chain security, incident reporting, um, and other issues as well. We are going to be seeing new requirements there on the area of secure development. Uh, there are additional requirements for critical software. NIST has already defined that concept and issued kind of their first view on how this might look. Uh, there is a lot of work under Section 4 on what would be the different requirements uh, that are going to be issued. Uh, there is an element of the s bond, the Software Bill of Materials, which is, of course, a key concept in the IoT security conversation, the policy conversation as well. NTAA has already issued their first view on minimal elements of the s bomb, and this is going to be incorporated in Section 4, and uh, NIST is going to provide us with more insights on that as part of that implementation. And, of course, there is a big focus, multiple sections on not just the importance of zero trust architecture across the board, but also how incident reporting and coordinate vulnerability disclosure practices are, are um, going hand in hand with software development security practices. Uh, so this is the continued focus on combining both processes, assurance practices, but also the focus on how vulnerabilities are getting remediated and what are the processes around that. We see that in the executive order really, uh, really clearly, and that, uh, that trend will continue. 
what else? Uh, so looking at the kind of major trends uh, in the landscape, this is not exhaustive, but of course in Europe uh, and in the UK, the UK have continued with their leadership on the uh, proposed regulation for security requirements for uh, consumer products. They've issued the results of their consultation in, on April. I encourage you to check that out. They're still focusing on key free requirements there. This is interacting with uh, their work uh, and the Europeans' work to develop at Etsy, Etsy and 303645, which is a standard for IoT security consumer uh, baseline capabilities that is referred to in this proposed regulation. We also know that IoT security is going to be a, a big focus in Europe. It's a pillar of the cybersecurity st strategy there of ENISA and the Commission. Uh, we are already seeing as part of the Radio Equipment Directive security and privacy requirements implementation in the standard bodies, the technical standards work there, how IoT security standards in particular might be leveraged, uh, 303, 645, 62443. Of course, these are ongoing conversations, but we are seeing that already there. We are expecting a new horizontal potential proposed regulation for product security requirements and maybe is even a voluntary certification scheme as part of that strategy. So that's on the European side, among others, some of the key developments. Of course, this is going hand in hand with the technical standard conversation, our efforts to come together as a community and develop a baseline understanding of the security capabilities for IoT from a technical perspective, a horizontal standard that would build upon the work in the vertical standards. So, so the work there is still ongoing, of course, the uh, NISTA 8259 uh, series of documents, which is really important. Anna Ito is going to walk you walk us through a little bit of the technical background there. Uh, the work there continues. Specifically, we are now focusing, NIST is focusing on building upon 8259A and building that federal profile, uh, the baseline capabilities for the federal sector as part of the implementation of the IoT Cybersecurity Improvement Act. The work continues on establishing our international standard, our harmonized standard to avoid fragmentation on technical security baseline capabilities. Uh, this, I'm one of the co-editors. This is happening at ISO IC at SE 27. We are benefiting from the perspectives of multiple standards and efforts uh, that are coming together there, uh, including, of course, from the European perspective, Etsy 303 645, and, of course, the work done by NIST 8259 and CTA 2088. Um, the role of vertical standards is still on the rise. We all understand that this is a very complex right, uh, ecosystem, and therefore there is going to be a role for technical standards on security that are really uh, targeted and tailored for the, the needs of a particular sector. So for OT, of course, 6243, uh, for the consumer sector, uh, 303645, and we are seeing basically how the horizontal standards are leveraging the vertical standards to work together in a flexible manner. Finally, the IoT security policy landscape continues to interact with other landscapes that are developing quickly. So we have the supply chain security conversation. I already mentioned you know, one development in that domain, which is the executive order. Of course, there are many others. This would be continued uh, focus area for policymakers around the world. There is a focus there on software provenance, software assurance, and the concept of the S-bomb, right? Um, software bill of materials is elevated as part of the executive order. There is continued focus uh, on vulnerability disclosure practices. Again, not a new concept in IoT security regulation, but we are seeing that all, all of that coming together. And of course, the conversation around con confidence measure. So not just what are the requirements or what are the potential capabilities you should expect in IoT devices, but how this is being communicated or measured. So that's the conversation about certifications, declaration of conformity and labeling, which is on the rise. Specifically, one element of the executive order is a pilot program on IoT security consumer labeling uh, that is going to be led by the FTC. Again, very interesting executive order. I encourage you all to check it out. There is a section there on IoT in particular. Uh, and of course, this policy conversation ties in with a broader concept of data protection, machine learning, trustworthiness, and AI trustworthiness that is continuing to be evolved. We have, of course, a new proposed regulation in Europe, the EU AI proposal for how they're going to approach AI regulation. Uh, and you're going to hear a little bit more about from Ria about the concept of AI trustworthiness. 
this is just a little bit of a mapping, an eye chart uh, on how everything is coming together. You're seeing on the left kind of the developments on both the uh, legislation side, the passing of the IoT Cybersecurity Improvement Act, how it connects to the implementation work done by NIST, including the federal profile. You're seeing the contribution from the standard domain that the consensus driven processes by the Council to Secure the, the Digital Economy, the C2 effort, how it fits into development at both A259, but both our work at ISO IEC to establish that horizontal international standards. And of course, on the right, um, some of the developments in Europe, right? And how they, with the implementation of the Red Directive, the Red Equipment Directive, we're gonna see even more focus on technical standards coming from IoT and how they are contributing and connecting to our work at ISO IEC. So just to, as a reminder, we've been talking a lot, a lot about this concept, uh, NISTER A259. I encourage you also to check out the presentations, the many presentations by NIST on this topic. Uh, this has been a wide industry consensus effort to develop that baseline understanding of the IoT security capabilities. It benefited from the work of the Council to Secure the Digital Economy to establish that consensus on the technical side with a wide participation from all the trade associations and other groups you're seeing on the left. And that technical technical baseline, it's a 100 page document, check it out, has now matured into a CTA led uh, technical standard that is providing more insight on how to implement this for engineers that is also contributing to the development, development of ISO IC 2742. Uh, I'm also excited to announce here uh, something that was recently published to call your attention to this document. It's a consensus around IoT security policy principles. Again, work by the Council to Secure the Digital Economy, building on their consensus on the technical side and basically pulling together a number of policy principles that can help inform policymakers as they go about how to potentially design a regulation for IoT security. Uh, very wide consensus uh, with international participation. It's a six, seven page document. You can check it out. It talks a little bit about the policy principles like design neutrality, flexible adoption of technical standards and the like, and translates these concepts uh, to the policy domain. With that, I would like to invite Anne to walk us a little bit through uh, the NIST documentation. Cybersecurity activities for IoT device manufacturer. As you can see here, uh, the target is a uh, manufacturer. It's about the steps that manufacturers should be performing when they introduce their device to the market. NIST emphasizes here the message that uh, IoT security should start early on. It frames the security actions around the IoT device lifecycle, bridging the manufacturer and customers. The proposed framework is very important. Uh, NIST uh, identifies six specific recommendatory action, pre-market and post-market. This is reflecting the principle of security by design. It requires manufacturers to analyze the customer's expected use cases, uh, their needs and goals, and uh, also create that communication channel with the customer. You could see here uh, SDL, vulnerability response, software update, device retirement, highlighted, and those are important uh, functions that need to be baked in early on in the product development. Cybersecurity core baseline is the technical core of 8259, and it is prescribed what manufacturers have to provide to customers to fulfill their requirements. So now, Let's look closer to that core baseline capability recommendation. NIST proposed six device capabilities as IoT device security baseline. The first one is device identification. This refers to uh, creating a capability during device manufacturing process so that IoT device can be uniquely identified to both logical, such as digital certificate, or physical, such as unique device number identifiers. Unique device identifiers allows device to be, auth be authenticated, managed, and are necessary to restrict their access to authorized entities only. Next is device configuration. 
The ability to change the configuration of device software after it's been deployed allows device manufacturers, integrators, and end users to upgrade security uh, retroactively and customize functionality for deploy uh, environment. For most devices, certain parameters will need to be changed or updated once the device has been installed in the field. Moreover, security flaws are often discovered after the device reached the end customers. Next capability is data, data protection. To work properly, IoT device must be able to send, receive, and store data. It is vital for device to protect this data and robot have the robust mechanism for identifying and restricting access to authorized uh, users only. As we mentioned, IoT is about data processing and the amount of data that IoT device stores and transmits makes them target for the hackers. Uh, and that drives the necessity for strong crypto protection to ensure the data integrity and confidentiality. Next capability is logical access to interfaces. NIST recommends that IoT devices have the ability to provide access only to authorized entities and should themselves only be able to interface with trusted uh, networks. This is supposed to limit the possible access point and reduce the number of attack vectors available for the hackers. Next category is software updates, and there is no doubt that this is a fundamental requirement. It describes the ability for the manufacturers or integrator to remotely or locally update the IoT device system after it's been deployed. Updates are essential uh, to provide device operation and uh, functionality and uh, fix the um, firmware software vulnerabilities as it gets discovered. And the last uh, capability here is the cybersecurity state of awareness. And this refers to device ability to recognize and communicate its own cybersecurity status to authorized entities. Uh, the threat indicator should be robust enough to prevent it from being altered or sending false messages to that, uh, the backend server. For device manufacturers and operators, it's important to have that process to determine if devices are operational, functional as expected, and flag any possible compromised device. Let's see how NIST 8259 portfolio expanded. This picture outlines the evolution of NIST uh, activities uh, that extended the range of full guidance for IoT cybersecurity. Of course, the primary goal here was addressing IoT device security and privacy um, controls for federal systems. We reviewed 8259, 8259A, and uh, a and B are the complementary pair, providing the balance of technical and non-technical requirements and giving more comprehensive guidance for manufacturers executing the six activities called out earlier in 8259. The new uh, 8259C is quite interesting. It describes the methodology that can be usable by any organization as a do-it-yourself toolkit. It's based on core baseline provided in uh, NISTAR 8259A and B and explains how to integrate the baselines um, with vertical or application-specific requirements and develop profiles suitable for specific device usage. This can be used for customer vertical segment requirements, industry standards, or regulatory guidance. NISTAR 8259D shows the result of applying this methodology in federal government customer space. It is supposed to address the requirement of SP800 13 that provides the guidance for federal agencies who plan to integrate IoT devices into their systems and infrastructure. 
it answered the question what are the are the abilities and actions that federal agency will expect from the IoT device and its manufacturer and third parties respectively. This framework leverages the SP853 security um, and privacy control and uh, newly uh, created updated catalog of cybersecurity capabilities. Again, you can see on this picture, the main idea here is to connect uh, customers, customers and the manufacturers, right, to the site of these guidelines. The expanded this portfolio don't only demonstrate how to address the IoT baseline requirements for the federal vertical segment, but I think it's also very interesting to see the tools uh, that they provide to the rest of the industry that can be leveraged for their specific usages. As Amit uh, demonstrated, there is no lack of initiative to address uh, Mm, IoT security. However, how to bring the balance in ever-evolving world of IoT, how to establish the confidence in the IoT device and the results that that device is producing. Industry was pondering about the question of trustworthiness in the equilibrium between expectations and risk. Let's understand what is the trustworthiness. Here is the definition of trustworthiness as it was defined by Industrial Internet Consortium. As you can see, trustworthiness closely ties to the confidence. So trustworthiness is a confidence that IoT system will operate in conformance with the requirements results from assurance that several characteristics of the systems are compliant with this requirement despite environmental disturbance, human errors, system faults, and attacks. On May 14, NIST published an essay on IoT device confidence. The purpose of the essay is to start a conversation about what it means to have confidence in IoT devices used by individuals or organization and the various ways of gaining the confidence. There are six roles outlined in the ecosystem of IoT trustworthiness. Uh, first is the customers of the category of the products. Um, next is the advocacy group that would watch out for the customer interest. Um, then we have manufacturers who produce the products, right? Regulators are uh, mandating requirements for a particular market or category of the product and enforce them. Uh, next would be the SDO and industrial consortia uh, that develop specification and requirements for the category of the product and establish consensus or industry standards for that category. And the last one is a very important body is the conformity assessment body that measures the conformity of the product to select the standard or regulation and provide certification indicating a level of conformity, which in essence means the measuring the conformity, or in this case, the measuring the security of the device. The size and diversity of the IoT device marketplace demonstrate uh, the need for variety of confidence mechanisms depending on the type of IoT device, use cases, and the risk involved in its operation. Specific confidence mechanisms will be the best choice for distinct situations. Bringing together communities of interest around particular device types and market segment and identifying the best confidence mechanism will need to be worked through a variety of forums. On the right side, you can see the picture that outlines the relationship in that ecosystem of trust. As we started talking about uh, measuring the conformity, the question how it's gonna be structured. So NIST is proposing to leverage the trustworthiness of the cyber physical system framework. 
As you can see, it um, basically bridging the stakeholder perspective with the result, the notion of trustworthiness. So it includes the aspects, as you can see on the picture, and those are high-level grouping of cross-cutting concerns. Concerns are the interest in the system relevant to one or several stakeholders. Here you can see functional, business, human, timing, data, uh, life cycle concerns. Facets are views on responsibility in the system engineering process. They contain well-defined activities, artifacts, or output for addressing those concerns. Uh, here there are three uh, facets identified. The first one is conceptualization facet that captures activity related to that high level goal, functional requirements and organization. Next is the realization facet that captures the activity surrounding the detailed engineering design, production, implementation and operation of this act system. And assurance space it deals with obtaining the confidence that device built in the realization facet satisfies the model developed in the conceptualization facet. It activates uh, the activities include evaluation of the claims, uh, argumentation, and evidence as required to address the important requirements of design, policy, law, and regulation. So uh, the core of this, of course, is trustworthiness concern. And let's take a closer look to those trustworthiness concerns. IoT trustworthiness relies on five closely connected concerns or attributes. Safety, security, privacy, reliability, resiliency. Uh, those attributes defined by several uh, SDOs, uh, the standard bodies uh, such as ISO, IEC, GTC, SC41, um, NIST, uh, as well as the Industrial Internet uh, Consortium. Uh, let's take a closer look. So security, as we well all know, is the condition of the system being protected for unintended or authorized access, change, or destruction. Safety is about uh, an acceptable risk or physical injury or damage can, can be caused by the system to the health of the people, either directly or indirectly. Reliability is the ability to perform its required function uh, under stated condition for a specific period of time. Resiliency is the ability uh, to withstand uh, abnormal uh, conditions and reconstitute uh, operational capabilities after uh, uh, the casualties. Privacy is the right of individual or group to control or influence the information related to them, the, uh, uh, how it will be collected, processed, stored, and um, how it going to be disclosed. So if we look at these uh, concerns, uh, we can see that security is in the center of this picture because it has a dual role. So it rep represents the concerns, right, or attributes of the trustworthiness, and it provides the underpinning for the rest of the attributes. Security failure in IoT device has the potential to undermine all other trustworthiness concerns of the device. So we are with the trustworthiness with building that both trustworthiness, we are entering a new field uh, where security, of course, needs to be formalized, needs to be measured, but also this additional aspect of the reliability, safety, and resilience, right, it needs to be also comprehended. So far, we have been looking for through IoT device lens, through the security policy, baseline definition, trustworthiness of the device, 
uh, right? But let's switch gear now and look from the uh, workload perspective and specifically uh, bring the AI machine learning flavors uh, to IoT device. So I'm inviting Ria to share her thoughts from AI ML trustworthiness side. And now I'm going to dive into the implications of IoT trustworthiness for AI systems. So as we've elaborated throughout this presentation, we're seeing a lot of the critical trustworthiness elements applied for the IoT ecosystems. Now let's look into the applicability of these elements for AI pipelines, both during the development and the deployment phases, and why this is critical. Now, what we've done is outlined the key characteristics outlined by NIST and their Trust in AI publication on trustworthiness elements for AI systems. I'm gonna call out these on a high level and some interesting considerations uh, to share with the audience. From a core security standpoint, we're seeing security, privacy, reliability, and resiliency as the critical elements here. So as part of the incorporation in an AI pipeline, we may assume the incorporation of monitoring mechanisms in order to ensure the reliability, the resiliency of the system end-to-end, -end, uh, considering um, the overall holistic pipeline, its inputs, outputs, and the processes made by the um, AI system. In addition to this, we may also con uh, consider some automated mitigation mechanisms that we can instill as part of this, where we have some thresholds that we're putting into place based on robust definitions of these elements that are then used to govern the design and uh, during the runtime of the system, the uh, processing mechanisms and similar of AI. Now, similarly on this note, we're also seeing the core elements including explainability, safety, objectivity, accountability, and similar. So here, this is also considering the idea of value alignment and um, alignment to the expectations of the users of the system, where we are uh, designing with um, our users in mind. This includes instilling um, abilities to uh, visualize or interpret different components of the AI pipeline as part of the explainability or transparency component, accountability in terms of being able to provide documentation, logging, and similar capabilities. Um, so users are aware of where data is being generated, are able to leverage provenance types of capabilities to keep track of how their data is being used, etc. And some additional implications. Now, on the last component, accuracy is a very interesting point to consider in the context of trustworthiness. Performance metrics such as accuracy are used in the design um, and the development of AI systems very carefully because these performance metrics need to align with the outcomes of the system and the user expectations. This is how we would go ahead through the different suite of metrics that are available for a particular use case and a particular data modality and pick the metric that we're looking for. In the trustworthiness context, this is especially relevant because we are designing the um, selection of performance metrics or the creation of new metrics in order to reflect these other vectors as well. Incorporating trustworthiness as a key output of the pipeline and not just considering about the accuracy or the overall performance of the system, but also these separate capabilities. So for example, this may include preferences of models that are more explainable, transparent, and reliable over models that have higher accuracy, given that they adhere to these trustworthiness elements or guidelines and are sustainable um, for longer term uh, consideration. In addition to this, it's also interesting to consider the differentiation of machine learning pipeline assets and data. So what really differentiates AI assets compared to general data protections and security and trustworthiness considerations for data in IoT ecosystems? Now, AI is adding a layer of complexity to this. One of the ideas uh, for answering this question in terms of what's the difference between you know, a machine learning model asset that can include you know, data exploration, uh, data pre-processing, AI model, parameter selection, hyperparameters, um, performance metrics, et cetera. What differentiates the security, privacy, reliability, explainability, all the trustworthiness elements lens of these assets compared to general data elements considered as part of the IoT ecosystem? Well, to that next, there are some interesting considerations in terms of the added complexity. AI is a consumer and producer of data, and it's constantly interacting with its environment. So I wanted to focus on the component of characterizing the behavior of data and how it can be different from a traditional data element that we're considering in the IoT ecosystem. So with AI systems, and in particular continual learning, the particular interesting implications we're seeing for IoT ecosystems with that AI flavor includes concept and data 
drift, where we're considering um, the target variables that we want to predict changing over time for concept drift. And similarly, the very features that we're leveraging for making predictions, or the AI system is leveraging, also changing over time in terms of data drift. Now, even more kind of going further based off of that, we're also considering catastrophic forgetting as part of this, um, you know, interesting added complexity that AI is offering, where AI models sometimes have the tendency to abruptly forget information that they previously learned upon learning new information. Now, this is a generally uh, fixable or accountable for in you know typical machine learning development and deployment environments but if we start to consider this in the place of iot ecosystems such as telemetry applications and similar when you're starting to evaluate and pick or select different ai models based on their adherence to these trustworthiness elements it's also critical to see how the environment is infecting our ai models and with um concerns just such as catastrophic forgetting and concept and data drift we're starting to see that these will be key implications that are adding in to the concerns and adherence of trustworthiness elements. If we have a model that we consider to be reliable based on a definition provided by IoT trustworthiness, but in the context of catastrophic forgetting is uh, quickly losing um, quality of outputs and uh, degrading in performance due to these mechanisms, this is something that we should incorporate as a quality or a behavior of data and the AI system. Now, in addition to this, again, going back on that note of characterizing the behavior of data, generically, we also have different types of data uncertainties that the system will be able to account for. Now, some of the questions as part of this may include, you know, what are the mechanisms that, again, adhere to trustworthiness, but also do not degrade the performance of the system at large um, that can account for these types of uncertainties? And these may include systematic and random data uncertainties, um, aleutoric uncertainty, um, which is um, now being uh, used in the... Um, a subset of spaces in AI um, in order to represent natural stochastic uncertainty associated with data and epistemic uncertainty, which is um, uncertainty that can be considered as a scientific uncertainty in the model of the process um, due to factors such as limited data and knowledge. So uh, being able to account for these different types of uh, data as part of the design of our systems, whether that be you know telemetry applications or similar is key. Finally, in terms of dependable logic and composite systems, we're starting to see AI systems influencing each other. Going back to my point on AI consuming and producing data on a regular basis and evolving its representations over time. So here, when we start to see different AI systems depending on each other, we're again starting to see some definitions of IoT trustworthiness and similar getting impacted um, and being changed in relation to this. So if we have, for example, multiple agents, let's say reinforcement learning algorithms working in parallel and being able to feed data from each other and learn from each other, if one algorithm fails, then how would the other behave? And what are substitutes that we can provide for the data that it's expecting the actuation capabilities and um, priorities that we're giving these, et cetera. So the prioritization uh, definition um, of these trustworthiness elements in relation to um, AI algorithms deployed on edge devices in the cloud raise a lot of interesting implications and open research and development questions um, that I've addressed here. Now I'm going to hand it back to Amit to understand more about the lessons learned uh, from this presentation. Okay, so we have given you a lot of information, uh, but all these reports, these developments we'll be talking about, you can find more information on online. Uh, and let's focus on some of the key lessons from this journey. So first of all, our policy landscape continues to evolve. We have seen developments there. Uh, the IoT security policy landscape is uh, definitely informed by developments in the supply chain conversations and the executive order is one example. We have also seen the rise and focus on measurable security practices or, or proposals around regulations or other policy vehicles for IoT, and specifically uh, the increased focus on labeling and certification. Uh, that is a key component of what's happening in the landscape. And we have also seen how IoT trustworthiness, the broader concept of trustworthiness, uh, is impacting IoT security and how the AI trustworthiness conversation is fitting together with the IoT security conversation in that regard. There have been, of course, some uh, notable policy developments in the area of IoT trustworthiness swerviness one of them is the proposal for the EU AI regulation that is already released. Uh, finally, we have seen the standard conversation, the frameworks, the uh, conversation continues to evolve. NISTER continuing their work on A259, specifically being in their federal profile, the community coming together in the technical standards uh, at ISO IEC, but also uh, CTA 28.8, many developments there that will continue and inform right, the policy conversations. 
And of course, uh, this reminds us security comes first. And I'm very passionate to be working at security in Intel uh, because part of our efforts here in IoT security is building that technology foundation to support the capabilities, right? From the hardware app is our collaboration with our industry peers uh, in the standard bodies to develop our understanding around IoT security. From the technical perspective, it's our collaboration with the ecosystem, with the IoT partner alliance uh, that Anait mentioned as well. And of course, is our work with the community, our working with the community as part of our corner vulnerability disclosure practices and the like, because we know collaboration with the community is a big pillar of security and IoT security in, uh, uh, in, in specifically as well. Disengagement, you know, continues to be a key priority for us. Uh, we are really focusing on developing those partnerships. And uh, for me, you know, personally, the partnership with this community, the security research community continues to be top of mind. We do so through our vulnerability disclosure program, for our bug bounties, for our assurance practices, and the work we do with the entire ecosystem on corner vulnerability disclosure. And we encourage you to partner with us. Uh, check out our Intel bug bounty, check out our efforts in the space, check out our vulnerability disclosure program, uh, and come work with us uh, to find uh, potential vulnerabilities. So big takeaway, uh, collaboration. The landscape continues to evolve. The complexity is on the rise. I'm excited to be collaborating here today with Ria and Anait, and I think our collaboration both with our industry partners, both as we build the technology foundations on security from the bottom up, both with policymakers as they go about um, considering how to regulate IoT security, and both with this community, the security research community, to work together to secure the ecosystem continues. I leave you with that message. Uh, we are very much excited to be collaborating with the IoT uh, village at DEF CON. Um, and please keep the conversation going with us. Check us out on Twitter um, and have a wonderful rest of Hacker Summer Camp.